Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. So even through your trials and tribulations, know that you can always have a little talk with Jesus because everything, everything is going to be all right.
today. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. Father God, we come before you once again. Praising you, dear Lord, and thanking you, dear Lord, for your presence in our lives, Lord God. And even though we are all not together in this one place, Lord God, we know that you abide within us wherever it is that we are, Lord God, in our homes, in our cars, whether we be on the rooftop or in our basement, Lord God, that you are there, that you abide in our presence, Lord God. So we thank you, Lord God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit today. We ask that you would just flood us, Lord God, as never before, with your Holy Spirit that we will know that you have been in this place. So we ask that you anoint everything, Lord God, that comes forth in this service. And we thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The church was the place that we met to create many of the advances that we enjoy today. So for that reason alone, I ask and I appeal to you to find a church to support it. We hope that you will support our church here, Institutional, as we are a small church who, in our best effort, try to serve God's word and try to do the, uh, help, be helpful for our community. So we hope that you will recognize us, but my appeal is that you support some church somewhere because it's very important, you know, that the churches live because we are still a great meeting place for the many wrongs that are ill in this society this day. So um, find a church, find some people in that church, know their character and support them. That is my appeal today. I also appeal to you because we here at Institutional are in dire straits as the wind has damaged one of our windows, you know, severely. And we are in dire need to get that fixed because if we don't get it fixed, the wind will destroy that entire uh, 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 window or that uh, uh, the stained glass that we have that, that has lived for many, many years. You know, I regret to be able to tell you how many years this church has been here. But uh, please, if you uh, see it in your heart, you know, be a blessing to us, you know, and help us with this, this problem. I don't know about you, but when I'm down, when I'm discouraged, when life is full of topsy-turvy circumstances, when it seems as if I'm oppressed on every side, there's one thing that makes it all right. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it all right. So this morning, why don't you sing along with us? Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right.
please join us in the reading of our responsive reading coming today from the book of Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11 and our relationships with one another. Let us have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in, the, in very nature of God, did not consider the quality of God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. By the honor of his death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and, and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord altogether. To, to the glory of God, God the Father. Amen. As I always say, in this book pertains everything unto life and godliness. Read it. And we will be reading from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Amen? Amen. Amen. And the word of God says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after having instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For God baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? 
He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you in heaven, into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The word of God for the people of God. All praises be to God. Amen. 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 Some of us, Lord, have to come up the rough side 
of the mountain this week. Some of us, God, had to, oh, cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But all in all, God, it's so good to be in your presence that whatever state we find ourselves, God, you are always there. For you said in your word, God, that there is no place that we can go that you cannot reach us even, Lord God, if we make our bed in the pits of hell, we know you are there with us. So God, we just come today to let everything go just to worship you because we love you, Lord God. Oh God, not so much for what you can do, but for who you are, God. You loved us so much, God. That you gave up everything, including your only son, God. That we, Lord, can have a right to the tree of life and that more abundantly, Lord God. So God, before we petition you, asking for anything we do, ask for your forgiveness, Lord God. And we thank you for a forgiving spirit, oh God. So search our hearts today, Lord, for you already know everything about us. And now, God, we lift up this worship experience again into your hands. We ask for fresh anointing upon everyone, Lord, every song, every prayer, every scripture, every task that is performed here today, God. Bless it, oh God, as only you can. Oh God, as always, we thank you, Lord, for the shepherd of the flock. And we continue, Lord, to pray his strength in you, God, that you will continue to undergird him with your mighty righteous right hand upon him, God. Lead him, oh God, as we follow him. And God, we lift up all of those, God, that are still mourning, We ask that you continue to comfort them, God. Meet them just where. They are, God, you need their strength through this time, Lord. We thank you, God, for healing. Oh, God, we lift up Sister Latoya today, God. Thank you for healing in her body. Continue, Lord, to strengthen her. Continue, God, to strengthen Sister Marlene. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you, God, for all of your grace, all of your mercy, your my Lord. Oh God, we continue to lift up this community, this church, your holy places of worship. Oh God. And as we assemble week after week, God, we ask that you strip us and give us the fresh anointing, Lord God. Oh God, we need you like we never needed you before, God. So when the day comes, God, Oh God, and we know they are coming, that we will be ready to receive all of those that you are preparing right now, God. And we thank you for being the best of that you are choosing for such a time as this. So God, touch us, mend us, and prepare us, my Lord God, to do what you have purposed for us to do, my Lord. You in advance for what you are already doing and what you will continue to do in the lives of your people. And it's with thanksgiving that we close this prayer, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for being God all by yourself. But even the more, God, we thank you that we know you as our Lord and Savior. For God, we release this prayer into your hands, for we ask it in your name. Amen.
this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. On this day, I'd like to use as a sermon title, Look at God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we praise your name and we thank you for your endless mercy, your endless forgiveness, and your endless love. You are always looking out for us, making sure we have everything we need materially, but you also care that we have everything we need spiritually. And so we cling to your word, because your word is life. Open up our hearts so we can receive what you have for us today. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. You are my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Today we're looking at the book of Acts. And you may even want to say that the book of Acts is the fifth gospel. <laughs> because the book of Acts is actually a continuation of the gospels. You see, Luke continues the story of Jesus and the church as he gets to the book of Acts. And here in our text today, we're seeing the story of Jesus' ascension into heaven. But before Jesus ascended into heaven, he appeared to his disciples and others over a period of 40 days, speaking to them about the kingdom of God. Jesus appeared to the women at the tomb. He appeared to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Jesus manifested himself to the apostles in a locked room. And then again, a week later, Paul tells us that Jesus at one time appeared to 500 believers at once. See, the disciples and other believers were witnesses of Christ's ministry, Christ's death, Christ's resurrection, but also the appearances as he reminded them that he lived. They heard, they saw, in some cases they felt and touched the risen Lord. And so during one of his appearances, Jesus tells the disciples, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus told them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. I think one of the hardest words for a Christian is wait. Sometimes we have trouble waiting because we're impatient. We want our blessings now. We don't want to be patient. We don't want to sacrifice. We don't want to toil. But sometimes we have trouble waiting because we're hurting. It's hard to wait on your healing when you're sick. It's hard to wait on a relationship to be restored when your heart is broken. It's hard to wait on a financial breakthrough when the bill collectors are at your door. But sometimes we have trouble waiting because we're gung-ho and we're ready to put things in motion. We're on the move for Jesus and we want to do things immediately. And I could imagine that the disciples had a renewed sense of determination after seeing and spending time with the resurrected Jesus. I could imagine that they were ready to get to work. But Jesus tells them to wait. As hard as it may be to accept, sometimes the best thing to do is to be still. You see, we like being busy. We, we like fixing things. We like to get our, our hands dirty. But if we say that God is in control, then we have to let him be in control. We can't take the control away from God and then do our own thing. Look, there, there are a lot of things that I want to do. And then there are things that God wants me to do. You see, the spiritual fulfillment comes when my will is submitted to God's will. And knowing God's will involves prayer. It involves learning God's character by studying his word. It involves the gift of spiritual discernment. You see, because Jesus told them to wait for a specific reason. He told them, wait for the gift my father promised, 
In a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so when God makes you wait, it's because God has something better for you. Something better than you could achieve on your own without him. Something that is perfectly suited for your situation. The right thing in the right time at the right place. You see, I may not want to wait, but if God says wait, then I'll wait for his instructions because he'll tell me how to do it. If God says wait, then I'll wait for his timing because he'll tell me when to do it. If God says wait, then I'll wait for his groundwork because he'll prepare the situation before I even get there. If God says wait, then I'll wait for his anointing because he'll give me the power to do it. If God says wait, then I'll wait for his glory because he'll make sure that everything turns out better than anyone could ever imagine. If God says wait, then I'll wait because they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If God says wait, then I'll wait. And as the story continues, Jesus and his disciples are gathered on the Mount of Olives. And as they're there together, the disciples ask him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? To the disciples, they should have known better. But they're still having a difficult time shaking off the notion that the Messiah would come to establish a spiritual kingdom rather than an earthly one. Mm -hmm. See, the kingdom of God is not an earthly kingdom, but it is where Christ rules and reigns in the hearts of the believer. Mm -hmm. It's a spiritual kingdom. Right. And so Jesus answers their question with some vagueness, but also a redirecting push. Mm -hmm. He says, it's not for you to know times or season that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Yes. Jesus, in a very gracious way, tells them that it's none of your business. Well, <laughs> it's not your business to know when he will return. They're just not, he's telling them, don't be distracted. Don't occupy yourself with trying to figure out when he's coming back especially since it's just something that you cannot know. But Jesus tells them what he does want them to know and what he does want them to do. He tells them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, Jesus has the disciples focus on the task at hand. He says that they are to be his witnesses. You've ever seen a court show, if you've ever been in the courtroom yourself, you know that witnesses tell what they saw and tell what they have heard. And so these disciples, they've seen the life and the ministry of the Lord. They've seen his sacrificial death and his glorious resurrection, and they are to go and to tell the world about this. The disciples, Jesus says, are supposed to tell his message in Jerusalem, which is the Jewish capital. Then they're to go to Judea, which is in southern Palestine, outside of Jerusalem. Then they're supposed to move up to north, to Samaria, where their enemies reside, and then to the whole world. You see, Jesus is being very intentional and specific about the geographic places that he mentioned. You see, Jerusalem can be seen as those who are closest to you, the ones that you live with and you, and you spend most of your time with. You can think of them as your family, your friends, your co-workers, even some of your fellow church members. You see, you are uniquely positioned to be able to witness to certain people because of your relationship with them. These are people who know you best. So when you tell them what God has done for you, they'll, they'll consider you as authentic because they know you. And then Judea, 
Judea refers to people that are outside of your immediate circle. Those people who you, who you may not know, but you do have access to them. That could be people in your neighborhood, people in your community. It could be people at your job or at your school. These are people that it, it may take a little effort, but you can get to them. And then when Jesus talks about Samaria, it's very important that we pay attention to that. Because the Bible scholars would know that Jews and the Samaritans were opposed to each other. They had a contentious relationship based on their differing beliefs. Right. So for Jesus to say that the disciples were to witness in Samaria is his way of telling us that we're going to have to go witness to some people that we don't get along with. I know you had a falling out with that person, but they still need to know about Jesus. I know that person has tried to sabotage everything you've done, but they still need to know about Jesus. I know that person is the last person in the world that you want to have anything to do with, but they still need to know about Jesus. And I know you're saying, God, you've got all these other Christians out here who can go talk to that person. So let someone else witness to my enemy. But God is saying, no, you're the one. Because when your enemy sees that you're obedient to God, it may just be the thing to turn them around. And you want to know the best way to defeat your enemy? The best way to defeat your enemy is to turn them into a believer. And lastly, Jesus says to go to the ends of the earth. Jesus is saying that we need to witness to every aspect of the world that we're a part of. Social media, fraternities and sororities, community organizations, sporting clubs, whatever you're a part of, you need to take Jesus there with you. And the beauty of this Jesus command, the beauty of the command that Jesus gives us is that Jesus prepares us to do it. Don't forget, before he gave the instructions on where to witness, Jesus said that we will have power. We'll have power from on high. So we'll have power to heal power over unclean spirits, power to tread on serpents and scorpions, power over all flesh, power to lead, power of the nations, power of his might, power of his resurrection, power everlasting, power, power, wonder-working power, for God is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that is the power that we have. So we can't say that there is anything that we can't do for Jesus. Because if Jesus says that we can do it, we can. Because he's given us all the power. Yes, yes. And so after Jesus finishes talking to his disciples, he's taken from them and from their sight. He is going up. Jesus enters a cloud. And, and the cloud is the symbol of the presence of God. Because remember in the Old Testament, it was the cloud that was there. They traveled through the wilderness, wilderness. And so here, now the disciples are looking up at the sky, and Jesus is gone from their sight. Jesus has gone to take his place at the Father's right hand, which is his rightful position of power. This ascension is not a small thing. It's not just a footnote in the story. Because in this ascension, we see that our Lord has been seated over everything, over everyone, and over every power. So we don't need to fear those things. We don't need to fear anything. Because Jesus has power over all things, and Jesus is in control. All of everything that is happening is done for the benefit of the church, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. And as Jesus rules over all things, he does what is best for the church and he does what's best 
for us as his followers, his disciples, his children. So don't ever forget, don't you ever forget that there is nothing higher than Jesus. There is no power that Jesus can't overcome. There is nothing that can overthrow the kingdom of Jesus. It's Jesus over sickness, Jesus over poverty, Jesus over hatred, Jesus over grief, Jesus over depression, Jesus over sin, Jesus over death, Jesus over Satan, Jesus over everything. Luke tells us that Jesus has gone up and he's gone up to the Father and he's seated at the right hand. And the disciples are standing there just looking. They're awestruck. They're astounded. They're amazed. Has God, done ever, has, has God ever done something in your life that was so incredible mm -hmm. that you were left paralyzed, speechless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see, my prayer for you is that you will be able to see God move in your life in such a way that you can't do anything but stop and say, look at God. Look at God. He made a way out of no way. Look at God. He defied the diagnosis of the doctors. Look of God. Look at God. He opened a window when all the doors were closed. Look at God. He stopped the weapons formed against you from prospering. Look at God. He made you the head and not the tail above and not the, the knees. Look at God. He picked you up, turned you around. Place your feet on solid ground. Look at God. Look at God. Look at God. The angels, the angels come over to the gazing disciples. And angels have always come in important moments in the life and the ministry of Jesus. The angels were there at Jesus' birth. They were there at the temptation of Christ. They were there in the garden of Gethsemane. And they were there at the tomb on Easter morning. And now as Jesus ascends into heaven, the angels are there also. The disciples have their eyes fixed on the sky. And, and they're, as I said, they're, they're just awestruck by what they have just seen. And the angel tells them, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. See, Jesus will come back in power, in glory, and in majesty. But we don't know when that will be. So what are we to do in the meantime as we wait for God's second coming? What did the disciples do? You see, the disciples, they listened to the Lord. They waited until the day of Pentecost. And once the Holy Spirit fell on them in an extraordinary way, they were Jesus' witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And as his forgiven and redeemed people, as we are those who have been given, anointed, we've had the Holy Spirit poured out upon us, we have the same calling and the same task we too are to be the witnesses about the grace that has been given to us, the love that has been lavished upon us, and the hope that has been handed to us. Yes. And we can't just stand around looking up into the sky. We've got to not just look up in the sky, but we've got to look around us. We've got to look at our lives. We've got to look at our families. We've got to look at our friends. And we've got to see how God is moving and working and opening doors for us to share his word with his people. We can't be oblivious to what God is doing and the ways in which God wants to use each of us to perform his good and perfect will. The disciples stood there looking up at heaven, but the angels came to them and said, why do you stand there looking at the sky? We are looking at God, but God is also looking at us. 
God is looking at how we handle the gospel. God is looking at how we deal with adversity. God is looking at how we use our gifts. God is looking at how we give our tithes and our offerings. God is looking at us to see if we are looking at him for everything we need. Yes. So we look at God for our direction. We look at God to get inspiration. Yes. We look at God to get our hope and our peace and our strength and our power. Yes. And after we look at God, then we get to work. We look at this world and we say, how can I make a difference? We look to our spiritual gifts and we say, how can I serve the Lord in a more excellent way? We look to our situations. How can we overcome the obstacles? We look to our enemies. How can we be peacemakers? We look to the people in our lives. How can I tell them about what my Savior has done for me? And of course, even as we look at the world around us, we keep looking back to God because God is our difference maker. We look to God because he is excellent, excellent. We look to God because he is the supreme overcomer. We look to God because he's the prince of peace. We look to God because he is our savior. We look to God because living he loved me. We look to God because dying he saved me. We look to God because buried he carried my sins far away. We look to God because rising, he justified freeing me forever. And one day he's coming back. One glorious day. Wait on the Lord. Witness to others of his mighty works. And watch the amazing things that God is going to do in you and that God is going to be through you. And when you survey all that is happening, You'll simply say, look at God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.
coming back one glorious day. And until then, let us get to work. Let us tell the world who God is. And it's simple as that, just telling the world to look at God. Because God is doing it all right now, even as we speak. And that brings us to the end of our worship experience. We pray that you've been blessed. We pray that you've been inspired, along with worshiping and praising, whether you've been inspired to tell somebody about what Jesus has done for you. You don't know what he did for me. He gave me the victory. I love him. I love him. I really love the Lord. Now unto him, who is able to keep us from falling and present us blameless in his presence with exceeding great joy. To God our Father, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now, henceforth, 